Hello, and welcome to the Lisa Says What podcast with my very special guest and friend of the show, attorney Andrew Rodenhouse. Andrew is the criminal defense attorney out of the great state of Michigan. He is the founding partner of Rodenhouse Law in Grand Rapids. Andrew is back to help shed some light on a few issues that arose over the past few months regarding the case of Georgia versus Eligio Nature Boy Bishop. On June 23, 2023, Judge Stacy Hydra granted Senior Assistant District Attorney Tabitha Pasmino's request for a gag order after the Drone Divas released a series of videos meant to exonerate Eligio that were narrated by a furu, a.k.a. Kayla Buckner. I began by asking Andrew what this means for the case. The, the court, when they issue a gag order, they're at a, they're at an interesting position in the law. So because we're, we're, we're running up against the First Amendment right to freedom of speech and to say whatever mm-hmm. it is that you want to say about whatever it is you want to say. So courts, generally speaking, are, are hesitant to issue gag orders, uh, particularly if it's uh, a case of public interest, uh, especially high public interest. Um, and so they generally try to err, in my experience anyways, is they'll err on the side of the Constitution unless and until it gets to the point where one side is trying the case in the court of public opinion versus trying it in a court of law. And so if a party is out there and they're making statements and for, particularly if they're false statements or their statements that could potentially influence witnesses in the case, uh, and you're making a statement that's not just to like protect the client or to protect the party, but you're trying to influence, say, so like think like threats, like if I'm, or if I'm doxing a witness and putting it out there that this witness uh, works here and does this and lives there and you know, they're liars and they're cheats and they're thieves. Well, now you're getting into witness intimidation and that is criminal. Mm. And so if you're out there putting out videos, like I, I'm sure that that's what these people are doing is putting out videos because that's what they tend to want to do. Um, and you're calling people out and you're just you're not making a what I would call a good faith statement. Like I've defended a number of clients in the court of public opinion um, because it's important. Uh, somebody gets charged with a crime, they're presumed innocent, but oftentimes that's not how the public perceives it. Or um, there's evidence that they didn't do something when they when they're accused of doing it, or vice versa. And so it's entirely appropriate for a, a, an attorney. Um, to defend a client in the court of public opinion. Um, we are seeing it now uh, with, you know, the Donald Trump persecutions. Um, and, he, you know, his attorneys are out there making statements uh, and they're trying to, because it's a, it's at the end of the day, that it involves political figures and it involves elections. And those are things that generally speaking, uh, the public has an interest in knowing. But if you're making statements because you're trying to influence the outcome of a particular trial or you're trying to influence a witness or you're trying to intimidate somebody well those are things that are not so protected under the first amendment and so that's where you get into trouble um and that's where you could actually get charged with a crime a separate crime um if you're intimidating a witness or or trying to keep them from going to court you're obstructing justice you're obstructing due process um, and the first step is to get a gag order. And if they continue to violate a gag order, then you've got contempt powers that the court has its inherent contempt powers to bring someone into court and find them in contempt of court. Now, how, how do we, what's the difference between uh, your First Amendment rights and intimidating a witness and what they've done here and calling out by name? The judge, the judge do, not, not now, now nature, nature boy didn't, boy do, didn't it, do it but the but his, the, wives, his did wives did it in defense, in defense of, him. of him right and so it, it, there does there's not a lot of distinction between who's doing it um 
whether or not it's the defendant, whether or not it's somebody on the defendant's behalf, whether or not it's the defendant's attorney. I mean, if I went out and publicly called out a witness on behalf of a client and did something that could be construed as threatening, um, I don't have any protection just because I'm a lawyer. Uh, it, it's, it's not about who's doing it. It's about the effect that it's uh, intended to have. And so if I'm out there saying that it's unfair, it's unjust, it's, it's, they shouldn't be prosecuting me. It's, I didn't do it, blah, blah, blah. That's fine. But if you get into like the witness lives at this address, they do this thing there. And then you expose things about the witness that are um, personal in nature. Um, then you're really crossing over into the, the criminal side of, of speech where not all speech is protected and certainly intimidating a witness that's not protected speech right the right. judge has already, already admonished him, him and, and denied, denied him bail, bail based, based on, on him telling, him one, telling one of his one followers, followers to reach out to, reach out to out the, the, the 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 victim yeah and so, and so that's, he, a, he has that's a, a big no-no right? because the courts routinely put in place no contact provisions um with with victims uh and it's so that they don't get intimidated and so that they can have their day in court and it's about protecting the integrity of the process now how, now, do, you, how do you does the, does the gag, order gag order extend, extend legally, legally to his his wives can they gag them? gag them it wouldn't well so that's interesting it depends on the wording of the order if it's so a court only speaks through its orders. And so if the court says you or anyone on your behalf, um, and generally speaking, the court can say, look, just because you, not, you might not even be tied to them, but if, if they're aware that this order is out there, then they can potentially be in violation of it. Now, every jurisdiction, now that, yeah, here's the interesting thing. Every jurisdiction is, is different when it comes to how inherent are the powers of each court, uh, because each states courts decide how inherent their powers are so i don't know how inherent georgia powers are and how broad or narrow they are um i know that where i practice law in michigan and in the federal court system uh they're pretty broad the the court is it has given itself broad authority to hold people in contempt uh or at least at the very least to order them in in front of the court and order them to show cause why they shouldn't be held in contempt so think about it this way let's say that i or let's say for not me, but a, another person is out there and they're not connected to any case or, or they're not connected to any of the, the people on the court's docket, but they're out there just talking about the court and how you know horrible the court is and the court's criminal and they're undermining the entire court. Uh, and they're, they're, they're talking about how witnesses are corrupt. The court would have uh, inherent powers to haul that person into court to bring them in and to say, hey, you're out there saying all this stuff. Um, you're undermining what we're trying to do here. What say you, good sir or madam? And they probably wouldn't hold them in contempt at that point in time, uh, but they would certainly give them a talking to and say, look, now you're on notice. And if you do it again, now you're on notice. And you might not be a party to the case. You might not know about previous gag orders, but I'm gonna bring you in and we're gonna have a good talking to and I've, I've seen judges bring people in that are not parts of cases and have a talking with them about, hey, you're out there doing this thing. Tell me why. Because like, it doesn't make sense from my perspective and you're undermining what we're trying to do here. Is that the biggest, the biggest uh, uh, factor, factor is the undermining, is undermining of, the, of, the, of the process? Of the process. Not yeah, so much and that's, that the judge gets her feelings hurt because they called her. No, I, I don't know a judge in this universe. Maybe there's one that exists somewhere, but I've never practiced in front of a judge that was so thin skinned that they get their feelings hurt by what somebody thinks about them. I mean, you, <clears throat> you wouldn't be a very good judge if you got your feelings hurt every time somebody thought badly of you because there's always half the parties in front of you are going to not like your ruling. So right. just by nature, half the people aren't going to like you. So they don't, they, they generally speaking, I, I've never met a judge that gave a flying rat's ass about what anyone thought about them other than their close friends. <laughs>
So of course. That's where it, now this is no, the it, video. It's all about yeah, it's Go all ahead. about protecting the process. It's all about protecting the state has a right to due process. The defendant has a right to due process. And it is all about protecting the right and of the people to have a due process court. I mean, the, the, the people writ large, the population that pays for the court, you know, through taxes, they have a right to have things done in an orderly and uh, due process fashion. Now, this is the video that I think was probably the most egregious because, I mean, these these people are, they uh, went after not only the victim, but the prosecutor, the two detectives, as you can see here, and then another private citizen who reports on this matter. And they named, they doxed her. And uh, uh, I wanted you to take a look at it. it. Sure, I'll I'll be happy to take a look at it. Is it lengthy? Well, we'll we'll skip skip through it. It's 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 always always lengthy with these people. All right, well, yeah, okay, I got it. So just show me the the important relevant parts. Right, Right. definitely. Definitely. The criminals responsible for this malicious prosecution don't let these people get away with their crimes. First, we have Gregory Moore, detective of the DeKalb County Police Department. Monica Panosian, detective of the DeKalb County Police Department. Tabitha Pasmino, head prosecutor who relies on online critics for information. And last but not least, Chantel Coleman, AKA The T, since false information information to the DA and harasses Mr. Bishop constantly. These people need to be investigated, talked about, and brought forward for justice. Please report these people of their crimes and help us spread awareness to the situation to free Elihio Bishop, an innocent man. Thank you. So that was the extent of that one. Well, first of all, let me just point out how ridiculous this is. Um, <laughs> I mean, they, they created a video and the whole premise is that Eligio is innocent and they know it and they're still prosecuting him. Um, and so that makes them criminals because they're prosecuting a man that we believe is innocent. Well, how about the alternate suggestion? He's not innocent. They're doing their job. They're going to prove him guilty in a court of law. The jury made to come back and say that yeah you didn't prove your case but at the end of the day the the people have a right to have that happen you don't get to just call them a criminal the the other thing is is that of what so the only crime they committed was because they think he's falsely accused but at the same token then they try really hard to keep a witness from appearing and it's like that that's not a good look either i mean if if he's truly innocent you want the victims to come forward and say that yeah this isn't true or that's a, a malicious prosecution so it doesn't it doesn't make any sense um it, it to me it just strikes me of people that live in the internet world think they can just put out whatever it is that they want to put out and it doesn't have any real world consequence um and that they can live in the comment section instead of in the real world and it's it ultimately it's a recipe for disaster and the their temple of social media crashing and burning to the ground now, now would, would uh, um, the t or aka, AKA chantel, chantel coleman as coleman, a private as citizen private or a citizen journalist, journalist would she have recourse, have recourse against, against them? them possibly i don't know what the georgia law is for um defamation um, but generally speaking, if you put out a false statement about somebody um, and you know it's false, uh, there's uh, typically uh, recourse and some type of action for libel or slander. And if they put out her private information, then there's, you know, invasion of privacy tort. So I don't know what the law is and what her causes of action would be. But just from a general matter, um, like what you would learn in law school is that, yeah, those are torts and that you could be sued for them. Now, um, of um, course, the, of course the, the, the detectives, detectives and, 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 the, and the, the prosecutor, the are, prosecutor used are used to this kind of, this kind of uh, nonsense, uh, nonsense from, from criminals or, or, alleged, or, or criminals. alleged criminals. But, but this, is this is coming from other private citizens. Other private citizens. Um, um, 
and yeah so there's and a, the, a, a the hive mind that's going on right like trauma. people yeah, so like there's a hive mind going on. So people are like, oh my God, these people say it, so it must be true. I like them. And so therefore what they say must be true. And it's like, it's a hive mind mentality. And mm. and so if people are saying it, it doesn't matter who you are. If you're saying it, it's false. You could potentially be opening yourself up to liability. And I generally speaking, I, I read comments. I love reading comments online. It's one of my favorite things. And by the way, pro tip. Pro tip, if you are reading a media source and they do not have a comment section for you to comment on their news, they're probably propaganda. So that's the pro tip. Yes. So if you're reading a Fox News story and there's no place for you to put comments in at the end of it, it's probably propaganda. Same mm -hmm. with MSNBC or Yahoo or wherever. That's the first thing I look for. We have a, a local news, news place that... It used to be they were very respected. At one point in time, they are very respected. And um, they had very good reporters and they had great coverage. And they had comment section. And one of my favorite things to do was when I would have cases um, that they were reporting on, I just loved reading the comment section because sometimes you'd get, like, interesting tidbits. Like, how does the public view this story? Right? Right. And so right. how should I play the, play the cards? Well, they took away the comment section because the comments started to turn against the paper, the, the, the website that published the story, and they were calling them out. One of my favorite things to do is that there was one particular reporter that just always had a narrative and so could never just do straight news. And so I would always write in the comments, I'd write alternate headlines for their stories. <laughs> and and they stopped they, they they shut down the comments they used to have a letter to the editor section remember how papers used to have letters to the right. editor? okay now they have they don't have that anymore they have letters from the editor they to, actually to have the audience. Letters, it's letters from the editor to tell you how you should be reading their stories and what focus to put on it i i follow i tried to follow them on facebook to do the same thing and i got booted off their their little platform that they had so I'm just a pro tip. Like there's this hive mind that happens, okay? And these people seem to be living in it. But they're in a and cult, so, so. Yeah, I mean, but that's what it is. It's all about mind control when you're in a cult. And so they, the judge ordered them to take these down, but they have resisted so far. And uh, yeah, yeah, at some point in time, the judge is going to have a reckoning with them. They seem to be under the impression that the judge and they should be trying to prove his innocence for him. Um, they keep saying that this is a lopsided prosecution and um, they don't understand the, 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 the how what the judge, they don't understand what their roles are. And well, does, you, does that surprise you? No, not at all. I think this. First of all, we're dealing with people that got into a sex cult to begin with. Right. right. So so as a general matter, I mean, when when people get into this kind of stuff, it shows one that there's some type of emotional need, right, that that's not being met somewhere else, um, that they're subject to having a, a narcissistic type personality. Um, they're probably very open and agreeableness. Um, <coughs> And they get into it and you can't get out of it because in order to get out of it, you have to tell yourself that, wow, everything I did was wrong going up to this point in time. And so in order to continue you not being wrong, you have to keep the delusion going. And what inevitably happens is that at some point in time, reality hits and it, it changes what you perceive reality to be and we end up in what's known as cognitive dissonance and then watching somebody go through cognitive dissonance is like watching them go through the stages of grief mm -hmm. it starts with anger they're angry that they that reality is different than what they perceived it to be right so they rage right and then they then they then they then they go through a stage where they deny it it's like it's not true it can't be true. And then you end up going through the stages of grief, including ultimately acceptance. But in the meantime, you have denial, mm -hmm. right? Where it's like, well, it, it didn't happen. It's not true. Um, and then, then you have the bargaining stage. Well, 
maybe if I do this, then maybe I'll get that. And so it seems to me they might be in the uh, stages of grief um, <laughs> where they're putting these things out. They're, they're, maybe they're going to start the bargaining phase where like, well, maybe if the judge will do this, then we can do that. Yes. Um, I think that is exactly a great analogy of where they are. Um, I don't expect that they will get to the, the end of that, which is. Yeah. I don't expect they'll get anywhere with it because the judge lives in the real world, not online. And <laughs> And quite frankly, the judge could care less what their thoughts are on the whole thing. It just the judge only just wants them to to not wreck the process. Now, now what, he, what another, he, another peculiar, peculiar thing, thing he did was, was uh, uh, released, released the, uh, uh, his, discovery. his discovery, and, and I, think I think the judge took great, great exception, exception to, that. to that. I mean, I mean but it only it hurts, hurts him. him. It, but you could speak to that. To that. Yeah, well, it's first of all, there's a lot of times the discovery is provided pursuant to a protective order because a lot of times it's sensitive, particularly in sex crimes cases. I mean, think about it like um, I'm going to use an example um, in the prosecution of child sex crimes. There's always some type of forensic interview with the child. Yes, it's a normal practice that they, those interviews are recorded because if it gets litigated, people are going to need to see what actually happened to make sure that the child wasn't making up a story. Those are generally provided to the defense as part of it with a protective order. And that one, we're not allowed to leave our client with any means to reproduce that evidence. Okay. And that, that right. means right. to re maintain strictly in my possession. Okay, and in the possession of my legal team. So my my staff and stuff like that could have access to it. But if somehow my client obtained that material and published it, think about what the, you're re-victimizing a child victim. And sometimes these interviews are very graphic. And so the whole idea, because they have to give you the evidence because that's constitutional. The way you solve for that is you have these protective orders and you have, generally speaking, um, you're not allowed to release evidence into the public. Um, there's some things you can. I mean, it's not like I have it because there's times I, I have when it was important and it was obvious and I was advocating in the court of public opinion. Uh, but as a general matter, you can't. And you have to know when those exceptions are. And a defendant, certainly just the defendant himself, not through counsel, but just on his own, putting evidence out there, that is a big no-no. Uh, one, I would advise my clients always against doing that. You, you do it through your attorney um, because the attorney will know when it's appropriate and what's appropriate. And sometimes clients, they think like, well, this just, they can have some notion in mind that the piece of evidence that they have in their, their grasp is the thing that conclusively proves their innocence when the reality is is that no there's an alternate way to look at that and it conclusively proves your guilt and so just like it's not what you think it is and then you're putting it out there and your attorney if i was the attorney for somebody that was publishing stuff online i'd, I'd have a real problem with that is that enough, is that enough to get you to, 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 to would that be enough to make you leave the case, the case? Potentially, yeah, especially if it was making my, making me ineffective and opening me up to malpractice. And, uh, and uh, we, we, could, it could also potentially sabotage your strategy. strategy. It could potentially sabotage my strategy. And at the end of the day, I mean, you're paying your lawyer to be effective for you. and You want him to be effective. Don't you want him to, to, to win your case or get the best result possible? Why would you <laughs> hamstring your lawyer? Exactly. But... Um, but uh, they think that this is somehow going to get him vindicated. Um, yeah, I, they don't I mean, realize I it. it. I understand what their thought process is. It's just a faulty thought process. That yeah, yeah. and I'm pretty and sure I'm his sure lawyer, lawyer has had a, had a heart to heart. If he hasn't, he should. If he hasn't, he should. I'm going to bet. I don't know these particular attorneys that represent him. I assume that they're they're competent at what they do. I, I mean, lawyers are presumed competent um, if they're being paid, you know, paid for their services. Certainly they should be. 
Uh, so I don't know what those conversations are. I know what I, conversation I would have, and I would have the knock it the fuck off conversation. Yes. Well, well the judge has ordered, ordered him, him a, a the gag order, gag order and, and also, also took away, took away his, his ability, ability to communicate, to communicate. With, with no visitations, no, no, letters, no letters, no phone no calls. Phone call. Well, I'm going to bet that there's ways to communicate, even when there's when the court's ordered no communication. So that doesn't. It wouldn't surprise me if he's still communicating. Um, you know, phones get smuggled in all the time. It just doesn't take much to smuggle stuff. If the jail's any decent size, it probably has smuggled contraband in there. Um, so that that wouldn't surprise me at all that that he's using a, a smuggled phone to communicate. Yeah, I, I, I would imagine so. He hasn't gone live. Uh, well, you you wouldn't go live. I mean, if OK, so if you're smart, you wouldn't go live. Right. You would you would keep it on the down low because then you would be proving the fact that you had contraband and that would be a separate crime altogether. And typically in most jurisdictions, those are stackable where um, if you're in custody and then you commit another crime in custody, you don't get to where like, oh, it's the same penalty for both crimes. It's like, no, you, you do one sentence and then you're going to do the next sentence because you did them while you're in custody. Um, what was I going to ask you next? So the other issue I wanted to bring up with you was the was sovereign, sovereign citizenship. citizenship. I, I sent uh, you the document. The document. Um, um, I'm trying, I'm trying I, I, to, to locate, locate them. them. On, On the 10th, 10th of, of June of July, of July Nate, uh, uh, Eligio, Eligio Bishop, Bishop filed, filed pro se, se while, being while being represented by, by an attorney. By attorney. Uh, uh, documents, documents that I don't, that, I don't know where he got where them got from. Them from that say that, that he that is, a is a private, private entity, entity and, and sovereign, sovereign from, from it seems like a last like a ditch, ditch effort. effort. Yeah, it, it what it what it strikes me as is is the last clinging of the we're at the bitter end of the rope and we're clinging to the last bitter end. We're trying the Hail Mary because nothing else is working. Let me just start with this. There's no such thing as sovereign citizenry. It, it, it's a nonsensical term. It's like jumbo shrimp, okay? <laughs> um, because you can't be a sovereign and be an individual unless you are the king, okay? Right. So right. only the king is the sovereign, and he's not a citizen. He is the king. If you are not the king, then you are a citizen of the country that the king owns, here in the United States of America, we have separate sovereign entities. Those are the federal government, they're a sovereign. The state you live in, they are a sovereign. The county or municipality in which you reside, they can, in certain circumstances, be sovereign. If you are not the state of Michigan where I live, or you're not the United States government, and I'm not talking the president, Okay, I'm talking like you have to be the actual country itself. Otherwise, you're a citizen. The president is not the sovereign. The president is a citizen. He lives inside the sovereign state of the United States of America. The governor is not where you live. Governor Newsom is not the, the, the prince of California. He's the governor. He's a citizen. Right. So just to be clear, there is no such thing as a sovereign citizen. You are a citizen. That is all. You're not sovereign. You're not an entity. You're not somehow. They, I know that they like to quote the U, the Uniform Commercial Code, and the Uniform Commercial Code cracks me up because it's not actually a thing. Each state adopts their own version of it, uh, and it's just basically to make sure that states end up with laws that are roughly similar for the purposes of trade. But unless you are a good, movable at time of contract, you are not subject to the Uniform Commercial Code. Unless you are an unborn calf or baby animal, you are not subject to the Uniform Commercial Code. You are only subject to the civil and criminal codes of your respective sovereign, the state. And so that always cracks me up. I can tell you that with this particular filing, my guess is that he filed it and the court just threw it out. 
Um, because if you are represented by counsel and you try to submit something, the court just automatically rejects it. They don't even read it. Um, what happens typically is that the court's clerk will intercept it. Um, they'll look at it because every document has to go through the clerk's office and the clerk will look at it. And um, if you try to mail it straight to the judge, it's the judge's clerk that will intercept it and review it. And if it's not, and they'll see, okay, this is the case and he's got a lawyer. So, and the lawyer didn't file it or send it to us. So what they do is they make a photocopy of it and they send it to all the parties and including the prosecutor's office. And mm -hmm. so I've had it where clients have, decided they want to make an admission and try to get a, a, a plea agreement on their own. And they'll write a letter to the judge talking about all the ways that they did whatever it is that they're accused of doing and trying to explain it as, you know, as a mistake or whatever. Well, all that happens is it goes to the prosecutor's office and now the prosecutor gets to use it at trial. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's the dumbest thing in the world. And so then you, not only is it a sovereign citizen document, which it appears to be, the court's not going to read it. It's not going to end up in the file in any way, shape, or form. Your attorney's going to get it, and it's going to be like, why the hell did you file this or try to file it? You go through me. I'm like, what, what, what am I even here for if you're going to try to do this on your own? Because you can't be in pro per with a lawyer. You are either represented by counsel, which you have a constitutional right to have, and if you can't afford counsel, then counsel will be appointed for you at public expense, and you have that right to have counsel, or you have the right to represent yourself. And if you want to represent yourself, that's fine too. You have a constitutional right to it. And the court will walk you through, or at least they're supposed to walk you through a, a step to make sure that they know and that they put on the record that this is a knowingly and voluntarily made decision on your part that you want to represent yourself. And that's fine. You have that right. But you can't do both. You can only do one or the other. Now, and so wow. if you have a counsel and you try to file something, it just it goes, it gets photocopied, sent to the, the parties, and that's it. Um, have you ever had experience with these soft sits? Oh, my God, so much. I've had a ton of experience with these people. Do and, they wear the fez? Uh, they can, those are the Moorish National ones. The Moorish um, Nationals. The Moorish Nationals. They're the same thing. It's It's... So the Morris Nationals, I typically find, are the minority communities and the sovereign citizens, uh, the classic freemen of the land. Those are seem to be the white nationalist people. And right, right. They, they actually make common cause. I mean, it's like they want the same thing. And, well, and don't so get them to just, band together. We'd be in trouble. Yeah, it's, it's so funny because it's like you guys are opposite sides of the same coin. None of it makes any damn sense. Um, I've actually done... Um, I've 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 written brief to judges to tell them how they need to deal with this person. I've been appointed standby counsel for oh, sovereign citizens because they all for some reason want to represent themselves. Right. And it's like but there's very specific rules on how the courts and attorneys should handle them. And quite frankly, if you just stick to the constitutional requirements, it's a pretty easy roadmap. Um, you're, the constitution says you're entitled to have a trial. So that's what we have. If the constitution says that you're entitled to have a hearing, then we have the hearing. Um, if you don't want to waive the hearing or you don't want to enter a guilty plea or you don't like what's going on, that's fine. Then we just have the trial and we just do it the hard way instead of the easy way. And that's fine. we do that too. It's okay. Um, what I find with the sovereign citizens is that it usually works out worse than better. And that they ah. oftentimes will need, end up doing needless time in jail. I had one Moorish national that spent almost a year in jail before he finally figured out that. And the only reason was, is he just kept refusing. He kept insisting. And the judge, he, every time the judge let him out on bond, he would go get caught driving without a driver's license. It was just like some stupid shit. And he ends up doing all this time because he just couldn't accept the fact that and, and, he, and he changed his name. He filed a federal lawsuit against the judge. And the funny thing is, is that most federal courts, they just they, they recognize these when they come through and they just summarily dismiss them. And all you end up doing is paying a filing fee. And so, it's yeah, I've had a lot of experience with sovereign citizens and Moorish nationals. And 
I've got a little really a lot of really funny stories about them that I could probably entertain your listeners for quite some time about some of the stuff, some of the antics I've seen. And usually yeah, it ends I, up with I would love to. Usually it ends up with them getting tased. So, so it's usually, <laughs> you know, it, it is. It's like sovereign citizen, sovereign citizen, I'm a sovereign citizen, call your supervisor, blah, 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 smash the window, tased. And that's it. Or release the hounds. And then the hounds, I call them the the either the bork bork nom noms, the police dogs, because they're like bork 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 bork, right. bork nom 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 nom. Or the or the furry <laughs> land missile. The furry land missile, and you just see a, a furry, a furry blur on the police video, and then all of a sudden there's just screaming. And it's like you had your chance, dude. Like, what were you expecting to happen? Right. So normal they, people just don't walk away from a police encounter. You, just, you 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 keep your hands where the police can see them. You follow their directions and you fight about it in court, not on the street. So you so you're saying that the saying judge that once they once the court once they, they once received they receive these documents, documents they tossed, they them. tossed them. Well, I don't in know the, if that's what happened in this in this particular case because mm -hmm. I'm not a part of this particular case. But I can tell you that as a matter of course, that's routine to have that happen. And so if I had to guess what happened is that's what happened. Because I, what I hear is that they, they buy these documents in jail because it's a business. And I think it's the worst national that sells them. Yeah. This one seems to be in uh, a little kookier than the other ones I've seen. Well, this was the four ninety nine dollars version. <laughs> the Dollar Tree. This was this was hey, I got this good one over here, or I got one I'll just trade you for your coffee packet. <laughs> like, well, I can't I can't afford the good one. So here you can have my sticky roll for the day. Another question that we have been getting, and when I say we, I mean me, myself, and I, is why is it taking so long? This has been going on since 2022 it's almost 2024 what's the hold up andrew well i don't know what the hold up is in in this particular case i don't think that it's been going on very long um in in my experience it's routine for cases that are going to go to trial to take up to two years to get to trial um i know that there is a thing called the speedy trial rule uh first of all it's not a rule uh, they call it a rule uh, maybe it was a rule at one point in time, but now it's more aspirational in nature. Uh, and to the extent that there is a rule, the rule is designed to prohibit unnecessary delay by the prosecution uh, to stop the prosecution from trying to gain an unfair advantage over a defendant. And so that's where a speedy trial comes from. It comes from the day when King George uh, would take count uh, colonists and put them in jail, detain them, put them in jail, hold them without charges, uh, and then not have a trial and just detain them. Uh, and so we, it's, it, we have, it, it's in kind of like what we did in Gitmo. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Well, yeah, there's a lot of truth in that. The question in Gitmo was whether or not they had the right to rid of habeas corpus and a speedy trial because habeas corpus and speedy trial go hand in glove. Can you explain um, what habeas corpus, corpus is for the audience? Yeah, so hey, you have the, the well, habeas corpus is an ancient thing where um, if a, if your lord, your feudal lord, took you into custody, uh, then you could petition to the king what's known as habeas. And habeas corpus is, is bring me the body, okay? And so it at its, its Latin root means physically bring the person here. OK, and so what a writ of habeas corpus is, is to a judge in our in our current legal parlance. It means this person has been detained. Their rights are being violated and they need to be released. And so the speedy trial goes along with the writ of habeas corpus. Like so we have to have a trial within a certain period of time. Otherwise, we're just detaining these people without trial. So in Guantanamo Bay, one of the things that they were doing is they were just delaying the trial. OK, and we're going through discovery. So here's some more discovery and we're going to find some more things. And so then time drags on. And it's designed to present prevent the prosecution or the government from using delay tactics to just hold you in custody. But 
there's that is the general rule the the big exception is that typically speaking it's the defense that's asking for adjournments on things and so anytime to the extent that there is a rule or a time frame then any delay caused by the defense doesn't count towards the rule so for example let's just say we have a 180 day rule that's what we have in michigan is 180 days that once 180 days pass if there's a delay then it's presumed to be uh detrimental to the defense but what you end up doing is going back and looking at well how much of that delay was caused by the defense so for example we have a right to a preliminary exam well i want to prepare for a preliminary exam but you have the right to have it within 14 days well i'm not going to be ready in 14 days i'm going to be on vacation for 14 days or i've got there's a lot of evidence to review i'm not going to be ready in 14 days well so then it gets adjourned well that's due to the defense and that's for the defense it's i mean it's for the defendant it's to the defendant's benefit uh and so oftentimes the delay comes because there's the defense is requesting it or during the pandemic well we couldn't do trials and that's not the prosecutor's fault the prosecutor wanted to do trials mm -hmm. but we couldn't and so that doesn't count towards anybody it's just like i'm sorry this is just what happens in a pandemic and so there's no way to fix that and like what are we going to supposed to do pandemic hits we can't do trials so we got to let all the murderers out of jail all right. the rapists out of jail i mean that that's insanity and so yeah, I get you have a right to a speedy trial, but if you're the one that's delaying it and you're the one that's causing it to, there to be issues, then don't be surprised when when it's delayed. A lot of a people lot of have, have speculated, speculated that, that these, these delays, delays are caused, are caused by, the, by, the, um, by, his, by antics. his antics. Well, and that that's I, I, I wouldn't I would say that that's a pretty probably a pretty good guess. I mean, because he's doing a lot of the things that. He's doing a lot of the things that that would potentially cause delays. And if he's having issues with his lawyers and then he's got to hire new lawyers and lawyers are withdrawing and lawyers are coming on and you're filing in pro se stuff. And then you got people's got to come around behind you and clean up all the mess. Well, yeah, that causes a delay. And oh, you can't oh. you can't attribute that to the prosecutor's office. They're not doing it. You can only attribute any delay for a speedy trial. Any delay that is attributed to the prosecutor's office is the only thing that's going to count towards a speedy trial rule got it, got it. Now, now there were some, there were some rumors, rumors floating, floating online, online about, about rico, RICO charges, charges that he was actually, actually a, criminal a criminal enterprise, enterprise because, because they took they the, took the when they were, they were during the during pandemic, pandemic they took out a lot of a ppp lot of, allegedly, allegedly took out took ppp out loans. loans and, and um, um I don't, I don't know if there's, if there's a, a for, prosecution for prosecution with these because they were, they were forgiven. forgiven. You know, most you of know, the, the PPP, PPP loans were, were forgiven. forgiven. Um, um, how do you, how you explain, explain the, a, the, RICO a RICO charge to a lay audience? audience? Well, so first of all, it's um, racketeering influence corrupt organizations is where we get the acronym from, and what it is, it's. Generally speaking, the way the, the way where the, the rule comes from is that criminal enterprises were using legitimate businesses as cover to conduct their criminal enterprise. So let's just say that you own a. Well, let's use this, the, the Sopranos, right? Tony Soprano. Yes. OK, the garbage company. Um, mm -hmm. OK, so. The garbage company is just a cover. I mean, yeah, they do legitimate garbage. I mean, um, but they also were running money through it. Um, and so when you if you're having a legitimate organization, so it's been expanded over the years, uh, and it's quite broad now. Michigan actually has racketeering as a um and criminal enterprise as a crime if you're involved in a shoplifting uh group. So let's ah. say that let's say that you and I and another person uh, were going out and we're shoplifting and that's our, our criminal enterprise. Um, and we could be charged separately with instead of just retail fraud, which is what it would normally be with a with a much higher enhanced version of criminal enterprise. And so I don't know what George's laws are on it, um, but if they were 
seeking to use legitimate enterprises for criminal purposes. That is the classic uh, racketeering and corrupt corporations, organizations, um, classic crime. Um, and, I mean, it is fraud too. I mean, let's just—it's fraud. That's what I was going to say. It's, I mean, it's um fraud, fraud to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But okay. But let's say I set up a, an LLC, right? And I, which are easy to do. I mean, most people—if you got any any sense for a hundred bucks or less—you can set up an LLC. Um, I wouldn't suggest it. I would suggest you hire an attorney and do something better than the hundred dollar special. But you can get an LLC for a hundred bucks. Right, and right. you can then have a shell corporation, and then you can apply to get money as ABC Inc. or whatever, Acme Corp. or whatever. I mean, Wiley e. Coyote could start one and call Acme <laughs> Corp. and get a bunch of PPP money and claim he was using it to catch the road running. Um, <laughs> That's basically <laughs> what they did. Yeah, and it's like so we got a bunch of money because we got this organization that, but then not actually have an organization. Like you don't have any employees. You don't. Um, you don't really do anything. You don't produce anything. You don't provide any service. It's one thing. It's one thing like you're doing it and you're not good at it and you're losing money. Okay. That's just bad business. And you know, that's why we have interest rates. It's to right, account right. for the ones that aren't very good. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's a thing. And, but if you, if you are out there and you're just getting money, you're using a corporation to commit fraud well then it gets enhanced to the to the rico well based on this case what you know um would it surprise me that they were committing rico no that wouldn't surprise me i don't know if they are or not but it wouldn't surprise me because typically people when they get into brainwashed clubs will do whatever it is and they convince themselves it's good and they convince themselves it's for the betterment of everybody and that they're not bad people that they're good people they're just misunderstood or you don't know or you don't understand and they can't see that because they're 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 masked they're masked in it they, it's like it's so close to them that they can't see outside that and it's when that mask gets pulled off and reality hits them that's when they end up going through those stages of grief because they're like holy crap because most people are good people and they have good intentions and they don't realize that what they're doing is bad. I mean, if you went back in time and asked like all the, the horrible people in history, like think about who those people are, like Hitler, right? Like, right, right. He thought at the time, I'm sure if you asked him, if you were in the, the bunker with him when the Russians were closing in and you, you're with Eva Braun. They probably had their and last the dogs. Don't forget the dogs. dogs. Yeah, and the dogs. They probably thought that they were doing the best they could for Germany. They probably right, didn't think right. they did anything wrong because they were so in it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the, I don't think you can find a, an evil person that if you went up to them and asked them that they wouldn't have an explanation for why they were doing evil, they would probably have a, one that in their mind was very reasonable. Right. Right. Because um, um these seemingly, seemingly honest, honest decent, decent girls, girls who you know, no. it kind of innocent, innocent um, um decided, decided to fly a drone, drone into, into the jail. jail. Or conspired well, to, they, to they, fly they, a drone. They, they 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 probably were innocent at some point in time. But when you start doing things that further the criminal activity you 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 move from being innocent from being manipulated into being a perpetrator and it's a it's a slope and it's a, it's one that's slippery and all of a sudden you can be slipping down that slippery slope and you don't even know it um i mean it just asked go the hitler example you the, the german guards at, at the nuremberg trials what did they try to say we were following orders we were one of the good people we got right, caught up right. in this in this thing. We got caught up in this mind hive thought, and we didn't. The, the world didn't let them off. No, no, no. Um, and, um, these, and these the judge has yet, yet to, to uh, uh, file charges file against charges. them. Uh, uh, indict them indict on, on the on a. Uh, well, and it wouldn't be the judge that indicts. Uh, I'm sorry. The, uh, yeah, the prosecutor. prosecutor might not have done. I mean, because it's quite possible they're very sympathetic people. Like, you know, I mean, to the extent that they're victims of of the sex cult. Right. Right. 
You know, is that why I, you I, think I, that I, they I, haven't I, so far? It, it's possible. I, I don't want to spec get too far out over my skis on speculation, but right. I, I I know from my experience with prosecutors' offices that they I mean, they're generally speaking, they try to do the right thing. Um, there's some out there that are, there's always bad apples, but generally speaking, in my experiences, the prosecutors are trying to do the right thing, um, and they're not unsympathetic to people who have sympathetic circumstances. And so mm-hmm. you get caught up in this and it's like, you're doing this stuff because of love and what you think is love. And, and, and so, yeah, they, they'll, they'll, but they, they can only tolerate so much because at the end of the day, it's about protecting the, the system and it's about protecting the, everyone's rights at when, when it comes to the criminal justice system and protecting the, 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 the perception of it. I mean, once, once, once it erodes where you don't trust the system, then it has no use anymore. I don't think any of these people people trust the system. system. I think think, um, by the very nature of the cult cult is, you know, to live outside outside of the system. system. So So, um, um, I think they're harming harming themselves. themselves. Well, and the court doesn't want, and the court and the prosecutor's office probably doesn't want them to harm the system though. So you want to live in your bubble, that's fine, but don't bring that shit over here. That's, you know, know, true. true. Um, I'm sorry, my sorry, daughter, my is, daughter distracting is distracting me. me. She let the dog, the dog out dog right out, on my right leg. On my leg. <laughs> um, um, so, so we, are we are waiting for the, for pre-trial. the pre-trial. And, and that, was that was scheduled, scheduled several, weeks several weeks ago. ago. And, and since the... Since the uh, the uh, malicious, the prosecution malicious prosecution videos, videos et cetera, has been, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, What's your uh, dog's name? Lady. lady. Hi, lady. Hey, lady. Everybody hey, saying hi, hi to you. Um, we've, we've got we've nothing. Got nothing. And, and, uh, the, the audience, audience is getting, is getting restless. restless. <laughs> well, yeah. So, hey, welcome to court. Um, sometimes it just gets delayed. So, hey, good news. It's called the court. And uh, one of the things they teach you in law school is patience. Um, right, right. And I've actually had cases that they just get delayed for whatever reason. And it's nothing you can do. It's, so I get it. I get you, you get frustrated by it. And you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know if somebody's on vacation or somebody's sick. You know, if the judge got sick or who knows, I don't know. I just know that there's usually some reason for it. And sometimes they've got other things to have, have happen. Like, let's say that you you were scheduled to go to trial on a date and then something happens and you can't go to trial on that date. Well, guess what? They're not going to schedule for the next week. They've already got other trials scheduled. And so who knows when the next time they have open is. Right? It could be a while. I mean, I was just at one here in Kent County where... Um, we demanded a trial, and I know this judge is is got a busy docket because I have another trial scheduled with her in December, um, and that was we only set that one a few months ago. So I was expecting probably sometime February or March, and her first open calendar date was in June of next year. Whoa! And it's like that's just the way it is sometimes, um, and it just I don't know. There's nothing you can do about it. So you just got to deal with it. You know, I mean, the only thing the only I find thing strange, about strange about it is about that, it that the, uh, uh, the in the last, the last filing, filing of the, the prosecutor, prosecutor, they said be ready for, be ready for court in July. July. And, then and then it just disappeared. disappeared. It just went away. Went away. And, <sighs> and that happens. It just does. I, and it's inexplicable sometimes. And the only people who really know are going to be the attorneys and, they and the judge. Talk. Yeah, and then now, there the, might not even be any filings on it. It just might be a phone call or an email. I've had that. It is all of a sudden you get a phone call, <clears throat> or more likely in today's world, an email, and they're just like, "Hey, uh, what we had going next week is adjourned. Uh, we'll get you a new date later," and that's all you get. And it's like, right. "Okay, uh, it's my week suddenly got free. What do I want to do?" Something I wanted wanted to ask you kind of off the subject, but it came up over the weekend, if you don't mind. I don't mind. And and that is the riverboat brawl. Ah, Oh, my God. I saw that. 
do, do you know what caused it? Like, how did it start? Yes. Um, there was a, a ferry boat. They were doing a tour of the right. river. Right. And they have a, a sign dock. Okay. A, um, some, uh, what do they call them? Leisure boaters had a pontoon boat okay. docked in their space, in the ferry okay. space, the Harriet 2. Okay. And they had been stranded on the ferry for 40 minutes waiting for these people to move their boat. Okay. Someone brings a smaller craft over to the ferry. The first mate hops in, goes to the dock. That's the brother you see. All right. Okay. That they thought was a security guard, but he's actually the first mate. Okay. And he asked them to leave. They blow him off. They give him the finger. You know, get the fuck out of here. We're chilling. Um, so he un untethers their boat, the the pontoon, and pushes it three feet um, out of the way so that the ferry can dock. Okay. Well, those guys lost their mind. Okay. And attack this man. And, and I don't know, I don't know when, he when he threw up that threw up hat in the air, it was like the was black, like the bat, black signal. bat signal. And people, and came, people to came to his rescue. rescue. Interesting. And then some guy. So that's how it started because I saw the video of the brawl. Yes. And I was like, this is insane. People have lost their goddamn collective minds. Yes, yeah. it, was it was a melee. melee. And. and what I, my question and then more is more people kept coming. Yes. Like, yeah, it never stopped. And people were, were coming and there's uh, some lady recording it and she's shouting and then she's like encouraging this. And yeah. it, it, was, it turned into like this gladiator warfare where people were cheering and they're picking sides. Well, in America, we America pick sides. Side. Coke, or Coke or Pepsi, Pepsi. Ford or uh, uh, Chevy. Uh, you know, that's, no, what, we that's do. what we do. Yeah, I know. So... My question is the gentleman with the chair. Yeah. Now he went El Cabong. I saw a funny meme on that today regarding. <laughs> so there, the, I, I saw a funny meme and it was uh, the guy with the chair was the Big Ten, and the dude getting bonked on the head was the Pac-12. <laughs> <laughs> that was a sports theory. Yeah, sports guys. reference for all you reference. people out there who know that the Big Ten just the Big Ten and Big Twelve just wrecked the Pac-12. So. Oh, I'm sorry. You have my condolences. Not condolences. I'm a Big Ten guy. Go blue. Uh, you okay. All the way. So I don't care. I'm happy I'm, to have the Ducks. I'm happy. Welcome. Ducks, Huskies, Trojans, and Golden Bears. So, or no, Bruins. The so UCLA is the Bruins. Bruins so welcome yes. to all those four schools. We're happy to have you in the Big Ten for all you Big Ten fans out there. Woohoo! Woo I know nothing I know about nothing sports. About sports. <laughs> so there's a there's guy, guy that entered the melee. melee. And start whacking people in the head with the chair, with the with the folding chair. Yep. What is his criminal liability? Well, I don't know what it is where where this happened. Uh, Mississippi, but I can tell you, uh, Alabama. So I could, of course, why not? Pick a place. <laughs> Pick an Alabama. That's a great place. <laughs> Screw the Crimson Tide. If you're a Crimson Tide people, uh, you deserve the chair to the head. <laughs> no, sorry, nobody deserves a chair to the head. Obviously, I got to say that now in today's yes. Days that, you know, Jerry Rodenow said everyone deserves a chair to the head. No, nobody deserves a chair to the head. I say that in jest. Um, but what that traditionally what that crime is called is felonious assault. A chair can be considered a dangerous weapon. And so when you when you commit the crime of battery, um, battery is a harm a harmful or offensive contact with another person uh, without their consent. Uh, when you commit the crime of battery and you use what is a, a considered a dangerous weapon, because you could kill somebody with a folding chair. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so when you are using something as a weapon that could potentially cause great bodily harm up to and including murder, then that is assault with a dangerous weapon. And that includes cars. And most people don't understand that, is that it is very routine for somebody in a uh, road rage incident to also be charged with using their vehicle as a weapon, uh, and that is also felonious assault. And what so does felonious that's my, mean? When I saw that, I was just like, felonious assault. What does felonious assault mean? So, like I said, it's assault with a dangerous weapon. Okay, okay. it's just. A and some states will call it that, just assault with a dangerous weapon. Um, the short form that that we use in Michigan is felonious assault, but ultimately the long form is assault with a dangerous weapon. 
if chairman was, was your, your client, client what, what, what how would you, how defend, you defend him chairman's my client yes <laughs> he's very sorry for his actions um he's willing to pay full restitution uh if the person was injured will offer to pay their medical bills um i would argue provocation um possibly self-defense at the end of the day i'd be looking to get him a, a, a good plea agreement because he's a good upstanding citizen of his community during normal times this is a one-off event and uh, your honor quite frankly you'll never see him again i think he's a successful candidate for probation and i ah. would, and i would be arguing to keep this man out of doing any jail time um because at the end of the day we have him on video smashing somebody in the head with a chair <laughs> I don't you can't get around that <laughs> just, right right I, I don't it's know how we're gonna get around that that's just like here's you here's a chair there's a person and you're smashing them in the head with it so and yeah that's 500, 500 uh, uh video cameras, video cameras pointed yeah. at him while he's doing it yeah I mean the, the, you're, you're in a melee I mean I, they could charge there's more charging things that you could do with this stuff depending on people's injuries um you know, there, there could potentially be conspiracy charges. I mean, at what point in time does this become an organized fight? Uh, and and you're a willing participant because you've decided to pick a side. Well, well the guy was the guy being, was being um, um, beaten. And well, there was I don't some, even you know, think I saw one guy. There was there was one guy down. I think it was uh, the, the heavy set black guy at the beginning. Um, they were kicking him in the head. Yes. Um, that that in my mind, that is assault with intent to commit great bodily harm less than murder. That's actually an, an even more aggravated crime than hitting someone on the head with a folding chair because he's down in defensive position. He's helpless and he's trying to cover his head and they're kicking him in the head. Um, right. There were like eight were like people on him. His, his neck's exposed or kicking him in the head. I mean, that is the kind of thing that does and can result in homicide charges because it, for the grace of God, he survived that without any that I know of any significant injury. But that yeah, I don't is think the kind of thing that, gonna, that's just, I mean, they're stomping on his head. I don't think anybody's going to leave this uh, whole incident unscathed, um, whether it's legally or physically. No, and my big question is how much alcohol did everyone have? I mean, this seemed to me like when I'm watching some of these people swinging at each other, um, they're not very coordinated. And so, right. Right. <laughs> it was a lot I, of just wailing past, around. I, I can I can tell you from prior experience that when you're intoxicated, you don't have a tendency to swing very well. Yes. So, so I could tell by watching it that there is a lot of intoxicated people, uh, and that probably impaired their judgment and made them more brave. There were a couple of dudes that like they were gonna get into the melee, and, and then they gave it a second thought, and you see them running away. And it's, and like, jumped into the back into yeah, the, the river. dude jumps into the lake or the river and it's like oh well, i was gonna fight i was brave it's amazing <laughs> what mike tyson said it best it's like everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face exactly <laughs> I, I used to i used to fight uh competitively when i was a much younger man and i hated getting punched in the face and so what i would do is, is as my strategy is i would have one of my sparring partners uh, punch me in the face before the fight just so oh, that i can oh. get it out of the way and just get it out you got hit now you're now it's done and now you can go on and it's so it, some people it's a strategy it's a strategy it's like i know i'm gonna get hit in the face because the second i get in the ring i'm the, the other guy's trying to right so don't right. be afraid of getting hit in the face but if you are afraid of getting hit in the face then don't go rushing into the melee all bloated up on whatever beverages or other intoxicants you have in your system and think that you're a tough guy and right, then all of a right. sudden you find out you're not and you're getting the crap kicked out of you what i don't understand is why that the the boat owner would be so upset that they just moved it like what's how how did that offend them i mean I they think that is what you say it's the liquor yeah because that's all it is it's like they took offense because someone touched their property but your property was in a wrong spot yes he could have yeah, just set it off to set it off to drift yeah instead he just moved it i don't if i had come back to my boat and somebody had just moved my boat i would not have been i would have asked like what did i do something wrong just because i would want to know did i do something wrong right just out right of well the captain I, of the ferry said that over the pa system he called and asked them several times to please 
you know, you move know. your so they were just being jerks. They were just being jerks. So the, okay. So the captain so we, seems we to think it was racially motivated. Uh huh. We have a saying in my world. It's called "fuck around, find out." <laughs> That's so, it. You, went, you, you fucked around, and now you found out. This is what happens. Like, there's consequences to your actions, and you didn't like it. And sometimes those consequences can be brutal. Right. right. The captain of the the Harriet Two said that he believed it was racially motivated. I don't know if that's true. I think that anyone conclusion. I mean, I get that there was like the people on the boat versus the people on the boat, and that they're from different groups. Right. Right. But I don't know if it's racially motivated. I mean, here's kind of my thought on this. Unless it's, I mean, I've never had the, I've never had to actually litigate a hate crime. Okay. Uh I know that that they've been charged at least where I practice and I've had the opportunity to at least consult on them. And so one of the things that strikes me about a hate crime is that most crimes are some type of hate. Right. right? Right. I mean, so to say that it's, I don't like the term. Um, I would prefer if we're going to use race as a consideration in the crime that I would prefer we not use the term hate. I would prefer we use some type of uh, racially motivated type language. Um, and then I would want to see like, is the crime only happening because the person is of a different race? Or is there another reason that it's happening? Like, so for example, um, let's just say somebody breaks into my house, and I find out that the person is of a different race than me. Mm-hmm. Am I being racially targeted because they broke in my home? Probably not. Probably they just saw a home that they wanted to break into because they could get nice stuff. Right. Right. And so I don't think that that has. When I look at this video, my first thought was, okay, it's a bunch of black people and a bunch of white people beating up on each other. And I didn't know how it started. And you told me how it started. And when I hear how that started, then it's like, it's probably not racially motivated. It's just how the groups worked out to be. Exactly. Exactly. It just, the. They came to his rescue. rescue. I don't think they knew him. him. Um, I think some of the people were crew, crew, but that doesn't doesn't necessarily mean they knew him. him. You know, so here's the thing. When it happens in the street and it's organic like that, how how do you know? Right? How do you know? And and so, I mean, my personal philosophy is like, like not just as a criminal defense attorney, but as just a person, right? So just going down to base Andy Rodenhouse. It's like, this is conduct that should not be tolerated in any society and every single one of them needs to be put in the freaking brig for a while and given the chill the fuck out pill and given a timeout mm-hmm. and say you you don't get to act like this in 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 society the the guy with the boat they moved your boat so the fuck what get over it i mean then sue him for you know trespass the chattels don't get into a fist fight, you drunken idiot. And then the, the people from the other boat, the one dude, they're swimming to the dock. And it's like, I could tell he's drunk because he's moving his arms more than he's going forward. And then he could hardly get out of the water. He was a deckhand. He was a deckhand? Oh, he, he well, he's a bad swimmer. <laughs> because if you're going to be a deckhand, you got to like know how to he, swim to shore, right? He jumped in fully clothed with his I know. boots on. I know, and he had to take his boots off before he could get into the melee. <laughs> I saw that. I'm like, what is going on here? And yeah, like, I, I think understand. You'd... Like, you want to get to shore to protect that. I don't see that part doesn't bother me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you're intervening in a fight to help somebody, right? Right. Right. Okay, but that only goes to the extent that you're stopping the fight. It doesn't go to now we get to put a beat down on the other side. Right, right, right. right. Well, that's well, just that's like extracting your person from that situation for like get in there and protect them so that they're not getting the beat down put on them. Yeah, I think yeah, that was his was initial point, point, but then I think they all got all caught up. It all escalates, and it escalated fast. A, yeah, escalated fast. I mean, if you want a commentary on American civil society, there you go. It it definitely yeah. is. It's very good job, everybody. Way to be. America, <laughs> stop! God, stop it! I, I, Can you I mean, imagine being uh, people uh, from around the world watching, watching that? that? 
and what they must well, think of us. Why is it? I don't. I'm see. I'm surprised not more countries have travel advisories to the United States. They do. Like you know how we issue travel advisories to go other places, and we're like, hey, don't go to Mexico, at least not the northern part, or don't go to this place or that place. I'm surprised more com- countries don't have travel advisories to the United States. I think they had them in the '90s. They could. I mean, I would just be like. If you come to the United States, avoid avoid large crowds of drunk people. <laughs> that, don't go to don't Vegas, Vegas then, <laughs> because there are always to, large crowds of drunk people. No, and those those police down there, they are they're they're good with their their weapons, and so they and they have a tendency to shoot first and ask questions later. So I would just advise people to, if you go to Vegas, stay inside your resort, stay relatively sober. Um, relatively relative, sober. Yeah, relatively. I'm not saying be sober. I'm saying relatively sober. Don't be blind drunk. Okay, because that's when you're. That's when bad things happen. Is when you're blind drunk. Absolutely. Not that I would know. I wouldn't no. have any clue that that's what would happen when you're blind drunk. But in Vegas. In Vegas, particularly in Vegas, on a bachelor party, my own. I'm sorry, I have no idea. <laughs> Did you have a, yeah, a, a, uh, a hangover uh, the week, the like the, the, the movie? movie? No, no, because I don't, as a, I'm a professional drinker, so I... Um, a professional, professional drinker. drinker. Yes, I, I don't get hangovers. So, oh, very good. Um, yeah, no, because I know when to stop, so I don't get a hangover. I, I, What's I, your I beverage, of my, beverage of choice? Um, well, I like, I like all kinds. I don't like tequila. Um, my normal go-to is Captain Morgan. I like Captain Morgan. Uh, but I love, I love I love I love rum like any kind of rum. Um, I, there's sometimes I just want a, a different type of rum, but like but my everyday is a Captain Morgan. I also like Scotch. Um, Lafrogue is my favorite Scotch. Um, a beer. I don't I can't have a lot of beer because I get I get full on beer. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I'll. I like like uh, a nice blonde. We've got Michigan Grand Rapids, where I'm from, has just an excellent brewery scene. We've got we're Beer City USA for the third year in a row. All right. Uh, yeah, people from Germany come here to do our our brewery tour. So, a, a number of them I went to college with. A number of them, like the New Holland guys, uh, I went to college with those those guys. Oh wow! Um, I, I remember when they first started that right out of college, and uh, they were in a rival fraternity. And by rival fraternity, we probably would have thrown down on the riverboat with, with, with <laughs> against each other. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. We, where where, where we, did you where pledge? pledge? I, I, I play as a local at Hope College, the Arcadian fraternity. And Arcadian? I, Arcadian, yeah. Uh, Robert Schuler was one of our founders. Robert Schuler Robert from, from the, the Crystal, Crystal Cathedral? Cathedral? From the Crystal Cathedral was one of our founders. Oh, wow. And, oh, wow. Yeah. That's and interesting. It very. And... Um, We've had a number of distinct uh, uh, members over the years, but I was a, an Arcadian. Uh, the people that started the uh, New Holland Brewing Company, they were frauders. And we were, they were our main rivals for, for for whatever reason. I don't really know. Probably because we we're more alike than, than not. Mm-hmm. And um, But they started there. I remember when they started the, the New Holland Brewing Company, and it was just this little place that was off next to a train depot. And um, I want to say on... Uh, what was the name of the street? It was on the, the street that the stadium was on. Anyways, um, it was just a little thing. Now it's huge. And those guys have done so well. They've got so many good things going for them. It's, it's fun to see it grow. And so, it's a Holland, Holland beer? beer? A New Holland Brewing Company. New Holland New Brewing Company. Company. Yep. And we've I have got, to so look here, for that. Got, so here in Grand Rapids, we've got New Holland. We've got Founders. We've got Perrin, uh, Brewery Vivant. Um, we've got all these big brewers. Um that all do like specialty beers. And so we've got, there's a whole tour. If anyone's ever interested in a beer tour, come to Grand Rapids. They have beer tours. They've got pedal pubs. Um, you can rent. What's a pedal pub? Uh, it's a, 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 it's a bar on a, like a bicycle. Like, so 10 people are on it. I have seen those. It, and then you pedal it around and you go to the different, different bars and, and breweries and try all the different stuff. All right. All right. That sounds yeah. so much fun. I can't wait to come up and uh, go on a beer tour. No, anytime. After I, this you probably case. won't get me on the beer tour because I'm like, like this. <laughs> I, I would, uh, I don't even risk drunk driving. I don't even, uh, not even remotely close. Um, I will only really drink at home. Uh, just I don't blame because, you. Simply because if I were to be arrested, 
I'm pretty sure that my mugshot would be on the front page of the news. <laughs> so it would be prominent local attorney arrested for DUI, and I'd have to do my best Nick Nolte impersonation for oh, like, no. crazy hair. Uh, <laughs> that was the mugshot of all mugshots. Yeah, yeah, it really was. Yeah, I Definitely. love that. Like, I would do my best. I'd like to just get my hair way up and do like look really surprised. <laughs> Like you stuck your finger in a light socket. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Well, Andrew, I thank you so much for your time. We appreciate yes, let you. Let me know when you're going to post this because I, I, I follow you. Yeah. Oh, good, good, good. Thank you so much. Um, yes, we're, I'm going to edit it up and uh, have it posted probably early next week. Sounds good. It takes me a minute. All right, so when are you coming back? Whatever you want, I've, I've got. I'll let you know about that homicide trial. Oh I've yes, got that in two, that's starting in a week and a half. But I don't know. We like I said, there's. I'm gonna have to go talk to them right now. So I don't know if we're gonna have a trial or not. Okay, okay. Got, it. got it. Maybe you can Maybe get him to confess. confess. Well, I don't know what he wants to do. It's up to him. That's the beauty of it. I don't. At the end of the day, I'm the lawyer. I don't make the decision. I just present the facts as they are, and then the client gets to make a decision. Let me ask you something that was asked. Um, someone asked me before. Would if Elysia was, would you take that case? What I th I have no idea. I don't know. I mean, I I'm not licensed in Georgia, so it's not. No, like if you were possible, just the I cold. Would. I, don't know. I would probably quote the guy a high dollar amount, and if he came up with a dollar amount, I'd, I'd do it as far as I could. <laughs> I mean, You'd at the end of the day, I, I don't. I have. At the end of the day, I, I do this job. I love my job. I absolutely love what I do for a living, but I'm also in it to make an obscene amount of money. So I heard that. I heard that. <laughs> yep. That's honest. That's honest. Yep. I wish I had I wish gone, I had to, law gone to law school. <laughs> All right, Andrew. Right, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Enjoy the All rest right, of your day, and we'll be in, we'll touch. Be in touch. Sounds good. Take care. All right. You All too. Right, you too. Bye.